Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Bridge from the Past, Art Across U.S. History. I'm your host, Mary, and this series is meant for students like you to help you get ahead in your U.S. history class. If you've watched us before, you'll know that pictures really are worth a thousand words. With summer fast approaching and the formality of school winding down, I thought we could do something a little bit different for this episode. I asked my coworkers, all of whom are history lovers, what their favorite image is in American history and why. Here is what they had to say. Hi, this is Tony Williams, a senior fellow with BRI, and I'm very pleased to be talking with you about Eisenhower's visit to the troops and the significance of that image on the evening before D-Day when he visited with the 101st Airborne. So let's get started. What you see there is Dwight Eisenhower, who's the Supreme Allied Commander, speaking to his troops. He's speaking to the 101st Airborne E Company, uh, 502nd Parachute Infantry Regiment. And he's sending these and 156,000 young men into France, into Normandy to invade. Uh, and you know they could possibly be going to his deaths. But Eisenhower visits the troops uh, on June 5th, the evening before. And you can see that he's talking with the men. He's looking in their eye. He was shaking hands with them. Uh, and they're standing there with, with rapt attention, really listening to what he's saying. He's, he's boosting their morale uh, for, for what they're, they're about to embark upon. Uh, and, and I just think it shows a remarkable amount of humility for Eisenhower to go visit with the very men he he's sending it into harm's way, uh, and you know he's not a, he's not afraid to do that. You know he he confronts that uh, directly, uh, and uh, as a little bit of context, uh, so Eisenhower is the the Supreme Allied Commander. Uh, we talked about uh, this particular regiment uh, that was going into battle. And, you know, Eisenhower, I think, expressed humility in other ways, too, in, in, the, in the day or two surrounding this image. Uh, he actually wrote out that same day a message uh, of failure in case the B-Day attacks have failed. Uh, he was going to take responsibility for that failure not blame the troops, not blame the allies, not blame the president or Congress. He was going to accept responsibility. And part of that message said, the troops, the air and the Navy did all that bravery and devotion to duty could do. If any blame or fault attaches to the attempt, it is mine alone. I think that's a wonderful civic virtue, right? He's taking responsibility. He's showing humility. He's accepting the blame. And contrarily, uh, he writes out this great message to the troops to inspire their courage and, and again, boost their morale. Uh, and so this is read to all the Allied troops. Uh, and this is just part of the message. He says, soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the Great Crusade. You will bring about the destruction of the German war machine, the elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. And again, he's not saying, I'm the commander, I'm leading this great attack. He says, you are this attack. You are heading into harm's way. Uh, you're about to embark upon this great crusade. And again, he's giving them credit. So he accepts responsibility in case of failure, but he gives them credit uh, for the success. Uh, and let, let's take a look at that image one more time. Again, this is the character of the man, of the Supreme Allied Commander, of the general, who is sending all these young men into harm's way, looking in their eyes, shaking their hands, and wishing them well, uh, wishing them Godspeed uh, as they uh, invade Nazi-occupied Europe. Well, I think it's a, a great uh, image to reflect upon. I hope you find uh, that reflection useful. Uh, and thank you very much for watching. Hello, Bridge from the Past viewers. My name is Chris Jansen. I am the Marketing and Communications Manager for the Bill of Rights Institute. And I am very excited to join you today 
to talk with you about one of my favorite pieces of art from US history and the person and the incident that it depicts. Um, I'm sure you have heard of Rosa Parks. She was a pivotal uh, figure in the civil rights movement in the United States. Um, but you may not have seen the image that I'm about to share with you. It's actually a sculpture and it's located, uh, it's currently housed at the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery in Washington, DC. Uh, the sculptor is Marshall Rumbaugh and uh, it's made of wood, it's a wood carving and painted. And it depicts a very uh, precise historical event that occurred on December the 1st 1955 in Montgomery, Alabama. Rosa Parks was a seamstress and she was on her way to work riding this, the city bus in Montgomery when uh, the bus driver um, demanded that she give up her seat for a white male passenger. At that time in Montgomery, there were, uh, there were laws that said that that uh, an African-American person had to give up their seat for a white person on the bus. And Ms. Parks refused. Um, this simple act of civil disobedience led to a boycott by the African-American community in Montgomery, um, a one day boycott that was then later picked up by Martin Luther King Jr. and went on for, uh, let's see, 382 days with the help of Dr. King and others. It only ended when the Supreme Court declared that bus segregation was unconstitutional. So I love this uh, sculpture because it tells a story and it also tells you a lot about the character of the individuals involved in the event. Ms. Parks is, de is depicted as a fully three-dimensional um, person with proportional head and body. And the two officers arresting her are depicted as tiny pinheaded um, representations of, of an oppressive state. Um, so he's actually having a little bit of fun with that in this. And I love that about the, the, uh, the sculpture. Um, I also just love the story of Rosa Parks because it reminds me, it reminds all of us that no matter who you are, you can stand up, take a stand with courage and conviction and really change the course of history um, with the help of a community, which she had at the time. And she did change history. Um, her, her act was one of the seminal acts of one of many of the civil rights movement. So if you're ever in Washington, DC and you make it to the National Portrait Gallery, definitely check this out. And I wanna thank you for your time today and I hope everybody has a great summer. Thanks. Hi, my name is Kelly Haynes. I'm a data analyst here at the Bill of Rights Institute. And I think one of the most important photos in American history is the one of Little Rock Nine's Elizabeth Eckford walking towards Little Rock Central High School with the angry mob behind her. This photo really captures a lot of the emotions of integration in the South. The two women on the right are silent, but still using their body language and facial expressions for intimidation. The guy in between them seems amused by the situation, perhaps showing a lack of empathy for the angry words and actions Elizabeth and the other Little Rock Nine had to endure to exercise their constitutional right to a fair and equal education. Hazel Bryan is behind Elizabeth. She's the most emotionally animated of anyone in this photo, clearly screaming something at Elizabeth in anger. Hazel admitted to joining the crowd in racist taunts and chants such as 2468, we don't want to integrate, and later remembered yelling, quote, go back to Africa, end quote, at Elizabeth. The girl on the left appears like she may be also joining in the taunts and chants, but not with the same level of emotion as Hazel. Elizabeth is stoic and outwardly calm as she and the other Little Rock Nine students were trained to be before their first day of school. They knew the crowd would likely be very angry, but they were not prepared for just how angry the mob ended up being. She had to brave the crowds alone because her family didn't have a phone, and so she was unaware that the other eight students were planning on carpooling together for their first day of class. She took the city bus alone. The emotions captured in this photo paint a very turbulent situation that was used to show the struggles of integrating even three years after Brown First Board of Education had been decided. 
I love that a simple question, what is your favorite image in American history and why, gave me so many different answers. They're really as varied as the people who spoke about them. And that's part of the fun. So I'm taking a bit of a break this summer. We'll be back with a few special episodes here and there, but BRI won't be taking a break this summer. So make sure you subscribe to our channel to check out all of the great content coming at you this summer. And you'll be the first to know when we start with new image here again in the fall. So until I see you again, be safe, have fun, and remember that history is all around you all the time and keep an eye out for images that speak to you. Take care, everybody.